swift, beautiful, and majestic, there was perhaps no more thrilling sight on the ocean than a clipper ship under full sail. Acres of canvas, long, lean hulls knifing through the waves as if they were suspended from the clouds. Dubbed moonrakers, skyscrapers, and cloud cleaners, these graceful greyhounds of the sea were nothing less than the ultimate sailing ship, setting records that have yet to be broken by anything that runs before the wind. A classic clipper ranged from 150 to 250 feet long. With three masts that could soar over 200 feet tall for its dozens of sails, and a narrow width of between 35 to 45 feet, it could dash over the water at speeds of up to 18 knots. In the building and design of these magnificent vessels, the United States led the way. Challenge, hurricane, sovereign of the seas, dreadnought, all great American clipper ships whose names evoked the energy and optimism of a young country just beginning to feel its power and all created by visionary designers who dared to defy tradition in search of a single goal, speed. Tales of hard driving clippers racing against each other and the elements captured the imagination of America and the world and still stand as some of the most exciting stories in nautical history. Clippers were first built in shipyards along the east coast of America in the early 19th century. Recent advances in cartography had led to the mapping of a number of new trade routes. Coupled with a growing demand for imported products, this created a boom in American trade. But items like Chinese tea and Eastern spices deteriorated when kept too long at sea. In carrying such valuable and perishable cargo, speed was all, and the fastest vessels could command the highest shipping rates. All of those factors were, were part of a need for speed uh, under sail. It was also the fascination of Americans with speed. It was an all-important part of, uh, of what's been in our conscience ever since. Like many types of sailing ships whose designs evolved over time, there was no strict definition of a clipper. The term clip, meaning to move quickly, or to move at a clip, uh, is probably the derivation for the term itself, clipper. But uh, it's been applied to a number of, of different vessel types, different rigs, different, uh, even different shapes of hulls. The one vessel uh, type that we most, I think, often associate with clippers is a vessel that has trim lines, that's uh, sleek, built for speed. It's got a lot of mast, a lot of yard arm, and it's got a lot of sail. Uh, and most importantly, that it uses a lot of sail day and night. It doesn't uh, reef sail for bad weather or nighttime. It, uh, it takes full advantage of its, uh, of its abundance of sail in order to make the greatest speed. Some of the clippers were able to sustain speeds of in the neighborhood of 18 knots to make 465 miles in, in a day. That's unheard of. Uh, some of the clippers were, were sailing uh, 2,200 miles in a, in a week. Uh, just remarkable passages that they were making. These swift Yankee moonrakers were the culmination of a quest for speed that had begun over 200 years before. The English and Dutch first built fast merchantmen called East Indiamen in the 17th century to cut time off the long voyage to the valuable trade of the West Indies. This tradition of fast sailing ship design appeared in America in the 18th century. During the American Revolution and the War of 1812, small fast sailing ships proved to be extremely effective privateers having great success harassing the larger, clumsier British warships. But the first direct antecedent of the clipper ship was a slightly later vessel called the Baltimore Clipper. This type of uh, vessel comes to be constructed and popularized as a coastal vessel, a trading vessel, in, in and around the Baltimore area. 
and uh, because they're they're very fast, they're able to negotiate uh, very uh, very very quickly. Uh, they're called Baltimore Clippers, and these Baltimore Clippers are really top sail schooners uh, that have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of canvas. They have uh, uh, tall masts, and uh, they they aren't as concerned with having a, a huge amount of cargo space. And uh, it's the Baltimore Clipper that probably is the earliest prototype for the style of vessel that later will become the American Clipper. As America's maritime trade expanded, these fast and agile ships continued to evolve, with their hulls getting progressively longer in relation to their beams. But what you find is in the 1820s, uh, the ever-increasing need for speed for, like, for say, uh, packet uh, lines start to develop. Uh, transportation from America to Europe, this, the need for speed starts to pick up. And so uh, marine architects look around for well, what works well for that purpose. And uh, well, gee, the Baltimore Clippers, uh, they really seem to uh, fill the bill. What if we were to work on that style and develop it and expand it and, and take the best characteristics of that particular type of vessel and, and build it in? And what you get is you get a, a vessel the size of a packet, but with the lines of a Baltimore Clipper. So that by the 1830s, you start to see the appearance of uh, vessels like the, uh, the Anne McKim. The Anne McKim. Built in 1833 by Baltimore merchant Isaac McKim and named after his wife, is often cited as the first true clipper. McKim instructed the builders to narrow the traditionally rounded bow of his ship into more of a V-shape and taper it under the stern to accommodate her full rigging and properly space the masts. The hull was lengthened to 143 feet. The Anne McKim heralded the dawn of a new age in merchant shipping. In a time when a six-month passage from China to the Atlantic ports was common, she slashed an entire month off the journey. Though the Anne McKim could carry only half the cargo of comparably sized ships, she was so much faster than her competitors that she more than made up for the shortfall with the higher rates her owner could charge by carrying only the most valuable merchandise. As advanced as the Anne McKim was, she was the product of a shipbuilding tradition that had remained relatively unchanged for hundreds of years. Ship designers at the time relied more on instinct and experience than theoretical principle. For the most part, the shipbuilders had um, the skill to create the designs, and they worked on their designs both from memory and understanding of what seemed good and fast about a previous vessel they had built, but uh, they also looked at what other people had done and looked for improvements that seemed to make other ships particularly good. They, they did not draw plans for the most part. They carved half models. Essentially, when they were constructing these ships, they would put in a midships frame, a bow frame at the most uh, compound angle or, or shape that they found, and a stern frame and between those three places, they would just simply bend the planking around that, and that determined the shape of the ship. They would then go and put the rest of the frames inside of this planking. And uh, those ships were primitive, but uh, they managed to come out with some, some fairly fine shapes. The next step in clipper design was taken in the 1840s by John Willis Griffiths a naval engineer who made a complete break with the traditional methods of the past. A brilliant mathematician, engineer, and draftsman, Griffiths approached his craft theoretically. Well, Griffiths was one of those people who did actually test designs and did actual paper calculations to try and get some sense of what was going to improve the design. His methods paid off with his clipper rainbow. Launched in 1843, she was 159 feet long and 32 feet wide, both longer and narrower than the Anne McKim. These features allowed her to make a record-breaking maiden run of 102 days from New York to China, earning $45,000 for her owners. This was more than it had cost to build the vessel. Ships and the practice of ship design would never be the same again. After the Rainbow's success, the intense competition to be faster led to an explosion in the construction of clippers. In 1945, the Yankee Moonraker was entering its golden age.
progressively longer and leaner in design, these ships would come to be known as extreme clippers. An extreme clipper ship has a very sharp prow to cut through the water. They're long, narrow, sleek, to take advantage of as little water resistance as possible. They're tall and very wide in the spars to pile on as much canvas, as much sail as possible to take full advantage of the wind. Sometimes this is at the cost of maneuverability, cargo capacity, all sorts of things were sacrificed, including creature comforts, in order to achieve maximum speed. Strongly built of the finest materials in order to withstand the extraordinary stresses of water and wind, these clippers were designed by a gifted group of naval architects who followed in the footsteps of Isaac McKim and John Griffiths. At their forefront was a shipbuilder named Donald McKay. Consistently fast in all weather conditions, McKay's clippers were the most successful of his day. Sailors told tales of big, full-rigged ships struggling through heavy seas when suddenly a clipper designed by Donald McKay would glide by under full sail. Sometimes, they said, if it were evening in the cocktail hour, there would even be passengers dancing on the poop deck. Well, McKay or Mackay, depending on how he'd like his name pronounced, was a genius without doubt. He uh, came from Nova Scotia, came down to New York, apprenticed there, and learned his trade very well. In 1840, McKay left New York for East Boston, where he started his own shipyard. They had superior machinery in Boston, in the McKay yard, where they could saw frames with very, very large uh, power-driven saws and other power-driven machinery. And there's another factor that's very important here, and that is that uh, Donald McKay was an excellent employer. He was a wonderful employer. He was highly organized. He knew where to get the materials and how to make the, the, the strongest vessel possible. In 1845, McKay began to build fast packet ships for the cross-Atlantic passenger trade. He built his first clipper, the Staghound, in 1850. After the Staghound's success, McKay began work on the Flying Cloud. One of those who watched the daily progress of the Flying Cloud over the winter and spring of 1851 was the poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Longfellow immortalized both the ship and its maker in a poem which he titled, The Building of the Ship. In it, he celebrated McKay as a virtuoso. Others called him the Leonardo of the Clipper Ship and the flying cloud would be among his greatest creations. The maiden voyage of Donald McKay's flying cloud was destined to become one of the most celebrated events of the day, a race to San Francisco against the newly built and just as spectacular challenge. Conceived by renowned ship designer William Webb, the challenge, with her knife-like bow, gently flattened hull, sharp keel, and soaring masts, was the most extreme clipper ship ever built. She was also the most extreme in price. Commissioned by New York businessmen George and Nat Griswold for a fee of $150,000, the challenge was double the cost of any previous ship. She was larger than any other vessel at the time, any other sailing vessel at the time. She was 240 feet, uh, had over 2,000 tons, and the top of her mast was over 200 feet above the water. She spread canvas when she had her stunsels out, which were additional sails that reached out from the edge of the, of the yards. When she had her stunsel set, she was 160 feet across in her spread of sail. So she was extreme in every way, and all of that uh, additional size, additional height of the rig, etc., must have driven her costs up. At the time, San Francisco was a natural destination for a race between clipper ships. Although these contests were usually spontaneous and informal, the stakes were high. A reputation for being fast meant that the winners could charge greater rates for cargo and passengers. And San Francisco was becoming a magnet for both. When gold was discovered accidentally at Sutter's Mill in California in 1849, San Francisco became the gateway to the gold mines 
and the place to make a fortune. Whether from gold or from transporting people and merchandise to the area at highly inflated prices. Where only a few years before, a ship a month might put into San Francisco for fresh water or wood. Now, as many as 60 ships entered its harbor in a single 48-hour period. George and Nat Griswold were determined to grab the largest piece of the California trade they could get. And with the challenge, they believed they had the means to do it. But they would need a captain who could get the most out of their ship. That man was Robert Waterman. The 41-year-old Waterman was the son of a Nantucket whaling captain and had years of experience on transatlantic packet crossings and China runs. With his Byronic good looks and flair for fashion, he was described as a strutting dude of sail. Like the Griswolds, New York merchants Joseph Grinnell and Robert Mintram also had their eye on California. At the time, Donald McKay happened to be putting the finishing touches on the flying cloud. When Grinnell and Mintram asked for a price, McKay told them $90,000, and they immediately bought the ship. Under the command of Captain Josiah Cressy, the Flying Cloud left Boston and arrived in New York Harbor in late April of 1851. A month later, the challenge was launched in the East River. The two finest clippers of their day were heading for a showdown to prove which was the fastest. Part of what you're dealing with in, in a race like that with two fairly evenly matched vessels is uh, you have uh, two different uh, ship masters. And uh, in here you have a, a, an interesting comparison of men whose uh, managerial styles were very distinctive. Uh, you have uh, a fellow like uh, Josiah Creasy, and uh, he was known for how he was able to work his men, and they respected him, and uh, they did what he asked them to do, and there was this, there was this real sense of camaraderie because he, uh, he shared the burden of sailing that vessel with them. And then, of course, uh, you have the master of the, of the challenge, Robert Waterman, uh, also known as Bully. Waterman, and I'm going to tell you this: this this man scared his men. That the only way they, the only reason they did what they did was because they were afraid he would actually shoot them. And I think it underscores that one of the reasons why this was such a competitive time. Uh, the ships weren't just competing against each other; it were the, the masters themselves, and their reputations were on the line. June 2nd, 1851. Battery Park in Lower Manhattan was thronged with spectators who turned out to watch the flying cloud set sail. Meanwhile, her rival, the Challenge, was still being loaded. The flying cloud had a head start, uh, but they weren't racing against each other, they were racing against the clock. The flying cloud left New York and had um, a rough trip um, down to uh, Cape Horn, but got around the horn. Part of it was attributed to the captain's wife. Josiah Cressy was the well-known, experienced, hard-driving captain, but his wife was a very competent navigator and uh, had the latest uh, information on tides and currents and so on. And uh, it was partly because of her good navigation that they arrived in, in San Francisco with an 89-day passage. Challenge, on the other hand, had a tough trip. She had a crew that uh, was not up to the level of Captain Cressy's crew. He had the first choice because he was he had left a few weeks before. And so by the time uh, Waterman, who was the skipper of um, Challenge, got aboard, he found that he had an inexperienced crew that he had to whip into shape. And unfortunately, that's literally what he did. He arrives in San Francisco minus nine of his crew members. Uh, several had been shot uh, because they hadn't moved fast enough when he had told them to move and you know, put on sail, and if you said, well, yeah, I'll get to that, no, you won't. <laughs> and he would, he would actually kill uh, on deck. But of course, uh, a master on board ship is, is, is virtually a dictator. He, uh, he's expected to be obeyed and, and obeyed immediately. Partly as a result of the low morale created by Waterman's harsh discipline, the challenge's passage to San Francisco was weeks behind the record-shattering 89-day time of the Flying Cloud. Furthermore, upon his arrival, the U.S. Marshal issued a warrant for Waterman's arrest on the charge of murder. He, in turn, accused six crewmen of mutiny. For the next four months, the courts were jammed with trials, suits, and countersuits. The mutineers were ultimately found innocent. Bloodthirsty editorials in the local papers called for Waterman's head. But in the end, he was only fined $400 for cruel treatment. <laughs> 
and it was discovered that uh, everything he had done, he had done within the full rights of of being captain. Even people like uh, Cressy uh, occasionally would have to put men in irons because uh, crew members would fight amongst themselves. I mean, discipline had to be kept on, on board ship. But I think the point that uh, Waterman's men were trying to make is that, all discipline aside, uh, shooting your men <laughs> in, in cold blood probably goes beyond the pale. There were captains who actually showed that kind of uh, complete disregard for, for human life for the sake of speed. All they were interested in was getting to their destination at the fastest possible time. Now, Waterman left the ship after that, um, did not come back. He stayed in California, became a rancher. And one of the ironies of it all is that when his body was brought back to Connecticut to be buried, it was brought back by train. The race between the challenge and the flying cloud was one of the most popular and closely followed events of the day. It was instrumental in vaulting the clipper ship to the forefront of the public consciousness. The ocean was America's apple at that particular time. It was a high watermark in our enthusiasm and verve for becoming masters of the sea. And after the American Civil War, of course, British steam navigation took over and, and uh, we, we were eclipsed. But for one shining, bright moment, we were the king of the hill. Americans had, had captured the imagination of the world. And in every coffee house, people were saying, well, I'll bet you that this ship, the challenge, can beat the flying cloud. And they would lay a wager. The great ships and their careers were known to a lot of people, to most people. They followed the careers of the captains, the way we follow baseball and football scores and batting averages now. There were races, there were records. So it was a time of great public imagination but it also was a time when uh, a young America began to name its ship Sovereign of the Seas, the Dreadnought, uh, the Witch of the Wave, no longer after a particular person, but after the spirit of America. And that's exactly what we had. In the clipper races around Cape Horn, Donald McKay's flying cloud continued to be the ship to beat. She once sailed 427 miles in a single day at an average speed of almost 18 knots. Soon, McKay's lightning bettered that by doing 436 miles in a day. In 1854, McKay's Champion of the Sea, in its time, the biggest sailing ship in the world, made a run of 465 miles in 24 hours while sailing to Australia. It is a record that still stands unbroken by any sailing ship. Storms, heavy winds, cold weather, and gigantic seas were some of the severe conditions faced by all ships and the mariners who sailed them but the speed of the clippers placed extra burdens on the vessel and their crews. They traveled at speeds of 15 to 17 knots, hour after hour, for days on end at times. And what that did was strain the rigging, strain the crews, strain the sails, and it often caused havoc. Uh, ships were dismasted, sails were blown out, and yet they were very ingenious in those days and were able to make their repairs at sea in many instances and carry on. These vessels didn't shut down for storms. In fact, they welcomed storms. Storms were, from their, from their point of view, advantageous because they took advantage of those high winds to drive the vessel even harder. Uh, one of the things that people noted when, when clipper ships came in was that they, were always, they had spars hanging and they had uh, uh, damage done to the rigging, damage done to the masts. A man who has endured the same brutal conditions that could wreak havoc on a clipper and its crew is world-famous seafarer Sir Robin Knox Johnson, who sailed solo non-stop around the world in a small sailboat. And it's just as dangerous now as it was then, and this is perhaps something that people forget. The waves are as big, they're certainly as wet. Our clothing's a little better, but it's still, the water seems to get down the back of your neck. It's cold, it's miserable. I, I've been literally in the Southern Ocean, trying to furl a sail, trying to take a reef in. And it was so cold in the sleet. No point in wearing gloves, you can't feel. I was having to bruise my hands by banging them on the wooden spar to get some feel in them. 
And then later on, I get to reading about some of these square riggers going round the horn. I find the sailors were up aloft doing just that, beating their hands to bruise the flesh to get the blood running so they wouldn't lose grip and fall. As a young deckhand on a large square rigger in the 1920s, retired mariner Captain Adrian Small experienced what it must have been like to sail around Cape Horn on a clipper. It was a wet ship and uh, there wasn't any heat. The galley fire was out for weeks on end. And uh, so we had a bad time. And it went on for several weeks. And uh, then we began to suffer from boils. And that was caused by oilskins chafing at the neck and wrist. We're living in oilskins, you would even turn in wearing oilskins. Your feet would be wet day and night. You couldn't keep the water out. We, we had to do a lot of sail handling and climbing the rigging, but that we took in our stride. In fact, it was drier in the rigging than on deck. So that, was, that is my memory of going around Cape Horn. Furling a sail on the yard arm of a clipper during a storm was like working on the ledge of a 20-story building during an earthquake. Yet sailors performed such feats daily as part of their normal routine. Men like Richard Likeke Goings continue to practice these skills. Goings helps maintain the last remaining clipper ship in the world, the Cuddy Sark, which is now permanently displayed at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, England. Now, when you're up here, it's a lot different than being on deck. Because uh, you can imagine out at sea, the deck is moving quite a bit. But when you're up 100, 150 feet above the deck, uh, it tends to be moving quite a bit more. It's kind of like trying to shake a fly off an end of a pencil. Like all ships, a clipper didn't stop working at night. It had to be kept going around the clock. So the crew worked in shifts called watches. For the average sailor, the watch lasted 12 hours. But the captain had no set schedule. He was on duty day and night. After the crew performed general maintenance first thing in the morning, the captain came up for a sight through the sextant, an instrument used for measuring the angle of the sun over the horizon so the ship's latitude could be fixed. The captain then chose the course and checked the first and second mate's navigation. Afterwards, the log chip was hove overboard so the ship's speed could be calculated. A chip log or log chip, whichever uh, discipline you want to use to call it, is basically a method for telling the speed of the ship through the water. It was a quadrant tied on the end of a line. You would drop the quadrant into the water, and then you would tie on this line attached to the quadrant a knot roughly every 47 feet 3 inches. And over a 28 second period, you would count the number of knots that would pass through your hand as the quadrant paid out in the water astern of you. And that would be the speed of the ship in knots that you were going. When the watches changed, the off-duty portion of the crew went to their quarters, which were either in the forecastle at the front of the ship or in small deck houses above the ship's hold. Though the accommodations were somewhat better than the squalid conditions that existed on board most earlier vessels, medical care was still primitive. Those who got sick received an all-purpose dose of salts, or Ipecac, and broken limbs were set by any officer who knew how. If a man had appendicitis, he died. Sailors who reached the age of 50 were rare. But life on a clipper also had its pleasures. Flying across the waves in such graceful vessels was an immense thrill. And just like the captain, the crew of a particularly fast clipper received an extra measure of respect from their peers. Sailors could entertain themselves by playing checkers or cards. And work songs called sea shanties helped with the rhythm of manual labor. Yes, sir, they were there as an aid to the sailors to pull in time, all work together. There were various sea shanties with various rhythms um, for use for certain jobs. So, well, 
capstan shanties and there were brace shanties. At their best, a clipper's crew blended seamlessly with their ship, making vessels like the Flying Cloud and the Challenge the fastest sailing craft of their day. For years, Yankee clippers like these dominated the seas. But across the Atlantic and Great Britain, the maritime tradition that had ruled the waves for centuries was about to reassert itself. The result would be one of the most stirring races that ever took place between clipper ships. And it was all because of a leafy green bush called tea. Tea was the most popular beverage in 19th century England. An avid British public spent huge sums on the tasty libation. But the prime tea growing area was in China, some 12,000 sailing miles from the London docks. By the time the tea arrived on the slower sailing ships of the day, it was all too frequently stale and ruined. The main barrier to faster shipment was a convoluted set of British shipping regulations. One law effectively limited British ship owners to building short, fat, and slow merchant ships. Another, called the Navigation Acts, prevented tea from being carried in the swifter American clippers, which by this time had overtaken the British in the worldwide trade of high-value goods. All cargoes had to be brought to Britain in uh, what was called British bottoms, British ships. And it was the repeal of the Navigation Acts that allowed other nations to compete in our trades. When the restrictive shipping laws were revoked in 1849, two things happened. The British suddenly became interested in building faster merchant ships, and the Yankee clippers entered the tea trade. What happened was one or two American clippers went across to China, loaded up with tea, and they got back to England three to four weeks ahead of the uh, British ships that were carrying tea. Well, then, of course, the British ship owner Came, uh, they came from all over, to, from Liverpool, from Bristol. They came down to London to have a look at this crazy American ship of this beautiful design. And, and of course, they were quick to catch on. The most significant of these ships was a clipper called the Oriental. Well, she caused an awful stir amongst British ship owners when she came to the Pool of London in 1850, because um, one day she was much bigger than most of our ships. She was 1,600 tons. Uh, and she'd done an incredible passage from China to Hong Kong in, in some 96 days, which nobody had done before. Influenced by the Oriental's design, the British started building clippers of their own. But they incorporated a few unique advances. The most important was the addition of iron beams and frames to strengthen the hulls. Known as composite clippers, the most famous of these vessels was the legendary Cutty Sark. The American clippers were all um, wooden. Uh, you had loads and loads of shipbuilding timber. We'd used most of ours during the Napoleonic Wars to build warships. And of course, the Industrial Revolution had started in Britain and we had quite a lot of technology in using iron. And it built very strong, um, robust ships which tended to leak less than all wooden ships and to survive longer. Though smaller and sometimes slower than the wooden American clippers, the sturdier composite British designs made excellent tea carriers. Nevertheless, the larger numbers of American clippers continued to dominate the tea trade throughout the 1850s. However, by 1860, most of the Yankee moonrakers were withdrawing due to their costly upkeep and an economic depression at home. With the Yanks gone, the annual shipping of the tea crop from China to Britain developed into races between British composite clippers. These contests were regarded as the great sporting events of the year, eagerly followed by ship owners, masters, merchants, and the public alike. The British used to bet on which ship would come home first, you know, just like the Grand National today, you know, our, our horse race that <laughs> happened, steeplechase. Perhaps the most dramatic of the great tea races occurred in 1872, between the Cuddy Sark and her chief rival, the Clipper Thermopylae. The race that developed between the Cuddy Sark and the Thermopylae was instigated by a in-house grudge match, but also there were economic factors involved. Obviously, the fastest ship 
the first one to arrive in London, sold the, the tea for a higher price. Also, that guaranteed that they may be loaded quicker when they return to Shanghai, which was a tremendous deal because that made them months ahead of their nearest competition. Two vessels more evenly matched than Thermopylae and Kutisar could hardly be imagined. Both ships are 212 feet long, both have 36 foot beam, both have a 21 foot depth of hold. So on those dimensions, the ships should be exactly the same. Loaded with Chinese tea and bound for London, Thermopylae and Cuttysark left Shanghai within an hour of one another. As they raced down the China Sea, it was sort of neck and neck. One ship was ahead of the other, and then they swapped. Then on the 15th of August, when off South Africa, uh, Cuttysark was hit by a large wave and, and lost her rudder. Caught in a gale and cut off from any hope of help, Captain Moody of the Cuttysark had only one option he and his crew would have to find some way to replace the rudder at sea completely on their own. What we've got to remember today is that 130 years ago, seamen had to be totally self-sufficient. If they weren't, they died. And so when Cutty Sark lost this rudder in 1872, they had the choice of drifting around the Southern Ocean forever until they starved, or to build a new one and to rig it. She was hove to in gales for seven days, while out of spare spars, they made a new rudder, hung it over the stern, and got it into position, held there by chains and takels. Somehow, the jury-rigged rudder held, and the Cutty Sark made the rest of the journey back to London safely. Thermopylae had already arrived, ostensibly winning their race. But all of England was amazed by the incredible resourcefulness of Moody and his crew. Thermopylae got home a week before Cutty Sark. Cutty Sark got home on the 18th of October after 122 days. But the ship owners awarded the prize for that tea race actually to Captain Moody of Cutty Sark because of his fine seamanship. The rivalry between Cutty Sark and Thermopylae would last for the rest of their illustrious careers. But even as they were running their great race in 1872, changes were overtaking the shipping industry that would spell the end of the magnificent clippers. Ironically, some of the very same designed features that made the Moonrakers successful help contribute to their demise. The huge amounts of spars and sails that drove them across the wave so swiftly created huge operation and upkeep costs as well. The continuing development of the steamship, which was becoming ever larger and more reliable, was another threat. But several other factors were also at work. Factors that changed the conditions that gave rise to the clippers. With the end of the gold rush and uh, the end of the emergency of getting people and supplies out to San Francisco in a, at, a, at a fast rate, uh, that begins to cut back on the demand for clipper ships. And then, of course, there's an uh, economic depression that settles in on the country in 1856, 1857. And with an economic depression, people aren't quite as uh, uh, ready with uh, capital to invest in uh, speculative ventures like building a clipper ship. So that by the time of the uh, Civil War, the era of the clipper ship here in America has largely gone, you know, gone the way of the dodo. It's, it's, it's gone. For British composite clippers like the Cutty Sark, it was a slightly different story. British clippers, however, uh, are still very much in use at this point in time. In fact, some of the great American clippers like uh, uh, Sovereign of the Seas and the Flying Cloud are sold to British uh, companies that need to use uh, whatever clippers they can to uh, engage in China trade, uh, the tea trade, and the Australian wool trade. And so you have some American clippers moving over into the British realm, but once again, it doesn't last much beyond the 1870s. Uh, so the, the era of the clipper ship, really, by the end of the 1870s, is, is both with the British trade and American trade, is largely over. <laughs>
In the years that followed, some of the most glorious greyhounds of the sea were reduced to hauling common bulk goods like cotton and lumber. Others ran cheap labor to South America and returned with their holes filled with guano. And guano was rather tough cargo for a noble clipper ship to be carrying, but uh, the d demand for guano or bird droppings in both America and uh, England, uh, and Europe, by the way, was uh, substantial. And therefore, many of them did go into the Chincha Islands and load guano and bring the guano back uh, for the fertilizer. The opening of the Suez Canal in 1869 was a huge blow to the remaining clippers the world over. It shortened the route from England to China by 4,000 miles, making the journey economically viable for the steamships of the day. Then in 1914, the opening of the Panama Canal finished the Moonrakers once and for all. Afterwards, the obsolete but still beautiful clippers were rapidly sold off to foreign owners who cut expenses by neglecting repairs and starving their ill-paid crews. In a final indignity, some clippers even served the steamships as coaling hulks. Still more went to breakers' yards, and many simply rotted away on far-off beaches. Yet despite their brief reign as rulers of the waves, nothing can dim the legacy of these magnificent vessels. In their day, they represented the state of the art in ship design, setting a pattern for radical innovation that is still with us today. But more than that, the Clippers changed history. They linked the Orient and Australia with Europe and the United States, exposing the people of those lands to new products and new ideas. The trade with the Orient was something that was going to be ongoing and it had a broad effect on American culture. The rare products that came back, the spices, the, the tea itself, the other commodities, the silks, etc., they all had their influence and changed the way we uh, look at the world and the things we had in our homes. However, the Clippers also had other, less tangible effects. They altered America's image of itself giving the nation a sense of pride and accomplishment that went far beyond the concrete advances in marine architecture and commerce they represented. Unlike the packet ships, whaling ships, and other workaday industrial vessels, unlike the smelly steamboats with their black smoke, these tall, swan-like clipper ships really captured the American imagination in a way that nothing else that we had ever made or produced in this country had. And we were also beating the British at their own game. They were the great shipbuilders, they were the great navy, they were the great commercial power, and here we were, building these fabulously beautiful, very romantic, white cloud-like vessels that were speedier and more famous and more profitable than anything the British were able to field at about the same time. There was a wonderful phenomenon that lasted only a short time, but it made us proud of ourselves. It gave us a new perspective on what American ingenuity and American enterprise could do. Yet in the end, perhaps the most indelible impression left by the Clippers is purely aesthetic. We must bear in mind the words of a famous English poet that wrote a few lines about these Clipper ships, and he said, they mark our passage as a race of men, Earth will never look on ships like these again. Sails fully set, running hard before the wind, a clipper ship was, and still is, a sight to thrill the soul.